come on, I know that Heather shouldn't have picked Highway there, Henry, but Henry, what are you doing? Yeah, I mean, you all peaked as well. What are you oh, doing, I'm Henry? Nowadays, just about every PC game can easily be shoved into a game console. Just slightly downgrade a few things, give it some playtests, bada bing, bada boom, it's in the living room. In the 90s, that wasn't the case. Everybody likes to joke about how Doom was on pretty much everything, and that's certainly not a horribly inaccurate statement. People crammed this sucker into a Super Nintendo for Christ's sake, but it wasn't a simple copy-paste job back then. On the Saturn, you had to get all these assets to function on substantially less powerful specs. It also had a complicated motherboard. Yet despite this, the Saturn got a lot of PC ports in its lifetime. They were in high demand. People like Sega were just looking everywhere they could for unique titles that could come across to their platform. The console manufacturers were desperate for this content to come out. Here in the world of October 1995, the Saturn has missed, worshipped as a best-selling masterpiece. The frames, audio, and video were woven into an excellent piece of point-and-click storytelling, fit for any gamer with patience and a notebook. Its Saturn conversion? Nearly perfect. The only disadvantage is using a D-pad as a mouse, but if you have a Saturn mouse, problem solved. But this was a 2D game. Sega already showed the Saturn's amazing 2D capabilities so far. 3D is a different story. Now, Panzer did prove early on that Saturn's 3D can look great and perform well. Some others looked great while struggling to perform. Others looked kinda booty while performing great. This one managed to get a thumbs down in both departments. Enter High Octane. It's a PC game from Bullfrog Productions published by a young EA. Later ported to the Saturn and PlayStation with an added title, The Track Fights Back. Now, was it bad because the hardware couldn't handle it? No, not necessarily. The Saturn has good racing games. High Octane was also rushed. No, seriously, they made it in less than two months. We then worked insane hours to get it from, you know, from being nothing to this racing game, High Octane. But video game players in the 90s weren't so forgiving when they played the Saturn port. No intro cinematic, no plot line at all. Just straight to the screen where you put in your name. Just what I like. A racing game so fast, it skips storytelling. If you take too long, it automatically advances to the main menu for you. Hell yeah. The race begins before you even pick a track. No menu music either. I decided to try a single race to start. The vehicles look very basic for 1995. No textures, and they're made of very few polygons. This made me think, hmm, probably just an older PC game ported to Saturn years later, right? Wrong. The base game on PC was made in early 95, but strangely, the vehicles in this original have textures and look pretty alright. The PC even got a proper intro. Compare the Saturn's blank slate vehicles to its Daytona USA port. Remember, the graphics of this port are considered a disappointment when compared to the arcade, but it's still way better than this. You get nine tracks, a pretty decent selection. Fun fact! The PC version only has six tracks. The other three were put in as an add-on sometime after the game released in March. The add-on also had new game modes. These features were included in the Saturn and PlayStation ports. As you can see, I spent a good dozen or so seconds figuring out where the accelerate button is. It's up. Yes. Up on the D-pad is accelerate. You have to keep it held while steering. This is common on PC, but not even close to common on console. The next thing I notice right away is how bizarre the steering is. It's like constantly driving on ice. Why? Because according to developers, High Octane uses the Magic Carpet Engine. The best way to play is by starting to turn well in advance of the curve. It's like your vehicle has to be pointing in the direction of where the curve ends before you go into it, if that makes any sense. L and R don't strafe like an F-Zero. Those are just extra buttons for your two weapons. 
You're equipped with a minigun and missiles. Your minigun has unlimited ammo, but can overheat when used too much. Missiles deal a lot more damage. You'll find missile ammo scattered around the track. You can hold B to charge a boost and release it to get a sudden surge of speed. Turning too much kills your boost. Now this is kinda lame. If you can clear hard turns mid-boost, you should be rewarded, not punished. Running into anything will absolutely kill your speed. Since turning requires preparation, last-minute reflexes won't save you. The draw distance is so bad, you're gonna slam walls like a bird in a Windex commercial. Track memorization is key, since you're practically one step away from playing it blindfolded. Here's actual footage of what getting unstuck is like. Other times, you hit things that aren't even there. Items around the track upgrade the minigun, boosts, refill the shield and fuel gauge, and occasionally give you supercar. You can also stop in these pits to give yourself more fuel, ammo, and health. I find just driving straight through them will give you what you need. As you can see, the tracks actually look pretty alright. They're well textured. You can see there are plenty of environmental objects put in like mountainsides and futuristic structures hanging overhead. The short draw distance makes curves hard to see, but these arrows scattered across the track let you know when there's a turn ahead, so that's helpful. The combat can be fun, but when you have too many vehicles on screen at once, the frame rate takes a serious nosedive. I counted single digit frame rates. This makes me want to speed away from the pack to avoid this garbage. And unfortunately, that means I'm missing out on what should be the most fun part of the game, high speed vehicular combat. You have unlimited lives, so dying means you just have to waste a few seconds respawning. No big deal. If you run out of fuel, you're forced to stop until it's recharged. After finishing a race, you have to sit there and wait for everyone else to cross the finish line before advancing to the next menu. Pressing start just pauses it. Since the default AI is pretty easy to race against, this can take up to five minutes. So grab a beverage, make a sandwich, do whatever. You're gonna wait. Mmm, stats. I wanted to start a championship, but it kept telling me I didn't have enough space for a save file. Now how much space could this possibly take up? All it needs to do is track the points and know what race I'm on. Look at that, 338 blocks. That's more than half the internal memory. Virtual Hydlide, the adventure game that lets you save anywhere, takes up less space. Maybe I'm missing something here, but this doesn't seem to make any sense. After winning a race and sitting there for several minutes waiting for everyone to finish, it tells me I can't save again. But then I go to manually save and it works. You can see I've grown attached to the vampire. It's fast and seemingly reliable. Kinda looks like the R-Wing on Star Fox. Like, Super Nintendo Star Fox. The Saturn can do a little better than this. Other vehicles look pretty funky. The Semi is hilarious, it's a second favorite. But I'm sticking with the vampire. I mean, it's it seems to be faster. It's gotta be faster, right? Right? The races are super easy, but the tracks are pretty fun to drive on. Lots of jumps, fun curvatures, and pretty cool settings. Slam Canyon has a lot of forks and cliffs you can fly through. The Chernobyl track is the only thing that hints at what kind of plotline we're in. Not even the instruction manual has a story. One thing that stands out is the terrain morphing. Some of the roads shift and warp in real time, sometimes opening up shortcuts or drastically changing topography. I like this. The sixth track sorta sucks eggs. It's narrow, crowded, and filled with sharp turns. It has unpaved sections that slow you down, even though you're floating. And if that doesn't sound awful enough, the hardware slowdown is crippling here. Tracks 7, 8, and 9 are the bonus add-on tracks, not seen in the base PC game. Ancient Mine Town is probably my favorite track in the game. Arctic Land is a little messed up. There's a checkpoint I missed when I started, 
That caused me to lose the race. Deathmatch Arena, that's an absolute blast. It's just a straight line that you go back and forth on, blowing each other up like it's Baby Park without a wall. Love it. Bro, Panda Tip! Don't go into this pipe thing. There's an invisible wall that prevents you from getting out. I don't know what purpose it serves. Here's your victory screen after winning championship mode. You unlock nothing. This generic dance techno soundtrack only has three songs. They appear to be MIDI tracks, using different software instruments than in the PC original. I don't know, there's a few good drum and bass elements here, but mostly sounds like electric kitchen gadgets. Listen to the intro to song one. It's like the musicians are using my microwave. Unlike Daytona, this has a two-player mode. If you thought the frame rate got bad, oof. The box also boasts an eight-player hot seat mode where you basically take turns controlling a car in one race. It's an interesting hot potato concept, but not a simultaneous eight-player split screen. One of the worst video games I've ever played. If you're looking for a game that'll suck the remaining fun out of your life, look no further than High Octane. High Octane for the Saturn is widely hated by many modern day reviewers, and they have pretty good reasons to slam it. The detailing is as poor as a partially downloaded porno JPEG from the 90s on really slow dial-up. The slowdown is awful at times, and the graphical downgrade is horrifying, but I was kind of surprised at how much I was able to enjoy it. Personally, I don't think it's that bad but I would consider myself foolish if I recommended this to anyone. The track design is actually well done, and there are more of them than in a typical Sega racer. Daytona only had three. I don't think using the magic carpet engine was a bright idea, because the vehicles don't control like they should. Fast reflexes and tight steering at high speeds are not rewarded, going against the true spirit of a futuristic racer. There's no solution to getting shot at. Slaloming back and forth does not dodge the auto-aim of your opponents. You could slow down, let them pass, and fire back, but this sets you back, while letting even more vehicles behind you fire away. So why did Bullfrog leave High Octane seemingly unpolished? Well, for those who don't know, they were a well-respected British studio in their time. Magic Carpet won several awards and helped pioneer early 3D. You also might recognize some of their other PC hits, like Dungeon Keeper, Syndicate Wars, and Theme Park. So what's up with High Octane? I reached out to Peter Molyneux himself. He tells me they developed the game in six and a half weeks. In six and a half weeks, to think of a game to program the game, and to release the game. He remembers the first board meeting after EA bought out Bullfrog. The publisher said they needed Dungeon Keeper done in two months so they could meet quarterly quotas, but Molyneux said they needed more time to make Dungeon Keeper good. They didn't want to rush it. And so they said, well, no, I'm sorry, we've really got to finish the game. And I said, well, look, here's what we're going to do. Rather than finish Dungeon Keeper, we'll create a whole new game and... Um, they kind of looked at me sideways as if I'd gone a little bit crazy. <laughs> and I said, look, just just, just give me a few days to get everything ready and, 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 and I'll, I'll send you a plan. So with a team of just five people, they went to work. When I, when I announced it to the team, I think I played We Are The Champions by Queen and uh, all really loud and said, look, we're going to do this, show them how, you know, how we can do a game. And you could see Sean's eyes go, yes, I could do it. Molyneux said Sean Cooper was one of its designers. Cooper described the experience to Gamasutra by saying, in part, I really started to trust my gut instinct. I think it's really important. Like a pregnant woman, she knows if something is wrong. I knew it before it happened, so I based all my decisions on non-calculated, undocumented, and what felt like the most fun. So that was how we got it done so quickly. The game was okay. It was never meant to be anything else. He was this fearless coder. You know, some coders are very, very precise and about the way they code, and they, they take their time to structure their code. But Sean used to just go in and say, look, don't worry about all that, I just do it. To put you in their shoes, 
Molyneux said coding video games was different in the mid-90s than what it's like now because of the tech. It would take several months of programming before you could even begin to see the game on screen and test anything out. For example, he said black and white took 18 months before any part of it could be play tested. It's terrifying, you know, it's like an artist painting a picture in a dark room. They already had the magic carpet engine ready to go, but one of the key issues was getting the tracks on screen. And I think he worked all night one night and he managed oh to uh, do a track editor, which was actually probably slightly more fun than the final game was. Yep, a track editor. After searching this a little more, I found this GitHub page where someone managed to reverse engineer a track editor. I'll throw a link in the description. High Octane is the video game equivalent of BSing a five-page essay two hours before it's due. But Molyneux said it was worth it. If it weren't for High Octane, Dungeon Keeper would not be the critically acclaimed award-winning classic that we know and love now. Do you feel like that was worth it in order to, to keep, make sure that Dungeon Keeper had the time it needed? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it was hell. Yeah. Every time that I've not made those that sacrifice for time on a game, I've regretted it for the rest of my life. I'll give you another example of a game which, in my opinion, you know, I, I think was a big missed opportunity, huge missed opportunity, and that was Fable 3, is... We took the time and the pain to make Fable 2. We, 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 it was supposed to you know, take, take uh, two years and we got another year's extension. And it was definitely worth it. Um, but on, on, on Fable 3, we didn't. And I think the opportunity to make Fable 3 exponentially better than Fable 2 was, was just missed then. High Octane saved Dungeon Keeper from EA. It's not an incredible racer, but without it, this legendary PC game would have likely been damned to the realm of mediocrity. I wanted to avoid bringing up the Fable controversy in this video, but Molyneux made a very interesting comparison. I felt like it was worth sharing. Remember when I told you how I thought the vampire was a faster vehicle? Well, listen to this. I have to confess to you now. So there were all these different vehicles you could race with, uh, but and, and they all looked, you know, so like a little motorbike thing, and there was a lorry, and they, but actually they moved all at the same speed. You didn't <laughs> really? change any of the balances. No, and people were absolutely convinced that this one, one vehicle was faster than this vehicle, but it was all rubbish because they all the all the. <laughs> Vehicles were exactly the exactly the same because we didn't have time to 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 change any of, uh, of, of that stuff. But um, that's amazing. Yeah, it, was just, <laughs> it really was an interesting an interesting experience, and we we kind of because of that we saved um, Dungeon Keeper from uh, from being finished too early and and not being the game which I'm really proud of now. Look at that. The stats show different speeds but they're all the same. Amazing. Simply amazing. There are rumors suggesting High Octane had early builds before this happened, saying the Bullfrog team would slowly work on it in their downtime as a fun side project. I asked Molyneux about this. He said it's likely, but whatever they had before the six and a half week development period would not have been much at all. We used to have these things called creative days, the idea of a racing track was one of those, but it wasn't really high, oct high octane. I could be wrong there, I could be remembering another time, but I, I, it may be something existed, but essentially the project was nothing. Playing the PC version, I found the controls and performance to be much better than on Saturn. It's actually good. Cars have textures, the draw distance is greater, and everything just looks and performs mostly how it should. You can actually have some fun with the fighting here since it doesn't cripple the frame rate. Despite Bullfrog flying off the seat of their pants, PC's High Octane had some pretty decent magazine reviews. People liked it, and if you search around the web, you'll find a handful of former 90s gamers remembering High Octane as one of their favorites. The Saturn port? Yeah, that's where things get hairy. Like I said, most modern gamers dislike it with good reasoning. But reviewers of the mid-90s had some 
interesting and mixed things to say. It was a bilious piece of dirt that made me cry out in pain. Did you say it was a brilliant piece of work and you'll fly me out to Spain? I'd like to preface this by saying the British Sega Saturn magazine was a wonderful publication. They gave it a 90%. <laughs> I understand the standards were different back then, I, I get that, but 90%? Just a few pages later, they gave Cyber Speedway a 68%. Like, yeah, it's, it's not great, but Cyber Speedway at least has manageable controls, better looking vehicles, much better speed, more draw distance, more tracks, and a plot. If you read the text, it says the vehicles behave like they're on icy roads. Maybe I'm crazy, but I'm pretty sure that's a description more fit for the Magic Carpet clone. Their write-up of High Octane says the game speed is exciting and the graphics are, quote, most passable. When talking about the Saturn's port, this could not be further from the truth. But I guess it's all opinions based on perspective, so what the hell do I know? Next Generation and Maximum were a little more reasonable, both giving it 2 out of 5 stars. Most other reviewers played the PlayStation version instead, and didn't really like it that much either. I'm sure it plays and looks just like the Saturn version. No textures on vehicles, lots of slow down. Oh. Psych! The Saturn got the worst version. What happened? Molyneux said at the time of the Saturn's port, he was immersed into working on Dungeon Keeper. He did not have a hand in the Saturn conversion. If you check Moby Games, Andy Beale is credited with carrying out the Saturn port. He left the industry in the early 2000s, but you might recognize him as a guy who in 2016 finished a previously canceled ZX Spectrum game called Quadrant. I was not able to get in touch with them before this review. Molyneux did have a hand in some of their Saturn development, saying they actually liked the console, even though it did make them rip their hair out at times. One of the great opportunities with um, the Saturn is it had this, these two processors, uh, but very unusually the two processors had to feed into one bus, so you had to code in a really different way to get the best out of the machine. But it, we, we used to love those challenges in those days. It was all about trying to find that extra half percent of power, you know, just just get the performance up, especially when you're talking about console when frame rate was, was absolutely king and key to the title that you were making. And the Sega Saturn was, was well, to say it had a very creative architecture, I think, would be would be generous. But it was really interesting to go for. Anyone familiar with 90s futuristic racers knows there's a big, massive, hulking elephant in the room that needs to be addressed. It's a game called Wipeout. In 1995, this was the king of high-speed futuristic racing. It was already highly anticipated complete with watertight programming and a delightfully controversial ad campaign. I mean, this thing was worshipped, and rightfully so. So let's analyze the later half of 1995 from the perspective of racing fans, trying to choose which console to buy. The PlayStation just came out, and it has this miracle of a game. The Saturn got high octane, paired with the exclusive but incomplete feeling Cyber Speedway. <laughs> Two bad-to-average games versus one great experience, plus a better version of High Octane. Not to mention, the Ridge Racer Daytona arcade port war didn't make Sega look great a few months ago. Sony wins this one. Coming out in October of 1995, High Octane on the Saturn was poorly timed. Many consumers saw this as a reason to get the PlayStation instead of a Saturn. This Game Zero review says, quote, with the smash hit Wipeout on PlayStation, Saturn fights back with High Octane. Like McNeely vs. Tyson, High Octane was down and out quick. This FAQ, written in 1996, says, quote, Gamers' feelings about this game vary greatly. Again, comparing it to Wipeout. High Octane was constantly being compared to its rival. It was inescapable. The Saturn did eventually get Wipeout, but not until May of next year, according to my research. That's at least half a year too late. It still looks great, though. It doesn't explain why High Octane looks like this. Even Chairman Segata doesn't have much to say about it. 
If you happen to get this game in a bulk lot, you don't need to throw it away. Try it out. You might not mind the weird controls and gratuitous slowdown. I got used to its icy steering pretty quick. But don't go in expecting a Captain Falcon experience. High Octane on the Saturn is dull when compared to other futuristic racers. Even Cyber Speedway blows it out of the water. For anyone interested in trying out High Octane, fire up the old DOS box and play the PC version. Trust me, it's much better, and actually pretty good. The PlayStation port is palatable as well. The Saturn port? It did not turn out so great. Hmm, which one, man? The one that goes beep boo boo bop boo boo beep. No, man, you're thinking of beep boo boo. <laughs> I want to give a big shout out to Peter Molyneux, thank you very much for speaking with me for this review. Now he did other games that got ported to the Saturn, so you can expect to hear him in future videos. Before I end this review, I want to leave you with one parting story from Mr. Molyneux himself, as he describes what the culture of game development was like back in the mid-90s. I mean, you, you kind of sit back and you kind of think to yourself, you know, what, what, what's changed? We're still doing what we did then you know we're still coming up with ideas and we're still trying those ideas out we still got coders and we still got artists but the way that we work and and the team sizes that we work with is completely different um you know it, 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 it's the games industry has changed so radically even in the last five years if you compare it to 20 years ago uh, let me just set the, the scene for you. You know, back back then, we were all the people that I worked with um, in, in, in the sort of early 90s, we were all really, really good friends. None of us had any partners or, or girlfriends or boyfriends. We just, you know, we ate, we drunk, we slept were um, uh, making games and that meant we did it for for a, an inconceivable number of hours um compared to today in today's world you know we are you know everybody a lot of people i work with are married they've got children they've got commitments outside we just do not work beyond six o'clock in um, at night back in back in the early 90s if you weren't working um, and I, I hesitate to call it working because it didn't feel like working. If you weren't working, then you were down the pub drinking. And if you weren't down the pub drinking, then you were sleeping. And that was it. So there was this incredible feeling of camaraderie and um, obsession about you know making a game or making a port or, or, or doing the best, uh, the best you uh, possibly could. Um, and that was that was incredibly different today. We still, of course, socialise down the pub, mm -hmm. but people don't aren't so obsessive. They've got lives outside of of making their games. Mm -hmm.